Mike Collins, Freeburg Community High School District 77, Board of Education meeting to order. Please call roll. Mr. Parrish? Here. Mrs. Staub? Here. Mr. Reynolds? Here. Mr. Henning? Here. Mr. Haas? Here. Mrs. Miller? Here. Mr. Gauck? Okay, we have a quorum. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and individual, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, do we have any agenda changes this evening? Uh, we do not. Do we have any public comments at this time? Okay. Public comments. Uh, are we going to go through uh, what's going to happen as far as uh, sanitation for the kids? face mask requirements. Are we going to go through that tonight? We are going to talk about uh, the, the plan for when school reopens. Um, not sure how much of that we're going to get into, but uh, I believe some of that, right? Right, and it's, it's really it's up to you whether you want the public to have comments at that time or if you'd rather the public have comments at this time. I think we'll wait and have comments at that time. I think that'd be more effective. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, we've all had a chance to look over the consent agenda this evening. Do we have any additions or comments on that? Great, did you make those changes, I said? Okay, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. We'll call the motion. Mr. Parrish? Aye. Mrs. Staub? Aye. Mr. Reynolds? All right. Mr. Henning? Aye. Mr. Haas? Aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. That passes. All right, move on to committee reports. Uh, we had a uh, building and grounds committee uh, prior to this board meeting where we talked about the second floor addition. Uh, the uh, architect on the project kind of went through preliminary plans, uh, kind of decided to move forward with the idea of adding two science classrooms, relocating the two older science classrooms up there, um, an art room, uh, the computer lab, uh, and then it's seven additional classrooms. Um, one of the things we want to be aware of, uh, our board members are concerned about, is the, uh, the cost. And so we're gonna move forward, uh, get numbers, and try to be as, uh, as accurate as we can with our numbers and uh, try to stay ahead of it uh, so that we make sure that we're not putting ourselves beyond our means. Okay, any questions or comments on that? We were all at that meeting. Let's move on to the student members report. Hi, so first I'm going to talk about uh, sort of the academics. Obviously it's summertime, so there aren't a whole lot of those going on right now. Um, so I'll just say like what the student body is feeling and sort of like what they're hoping for coming back to school. Um, most students want as little change as possible to the schedules and procedures of SCHS within reason. Obviously they want to stay safe. Um, most students that I've been in communication with say they're willing to wear masks and maintain proper social distancing in order to return to school. Um, something that I personally feel would be important to stress further that you need to wear masks in school. Um, for certain uh, students and parents, if they're opposed to masks, info could be sent out before school begins, stressing the importance of them and to remind students to keep them on. Um, posters could even be hung around the school uh, to show that it is very important that all of my fellow students uh, wear a mask to maintain an outbreak um, and if social distancing is not possible. Um, and after that, I'll talk about athletics. Um, most sports have continued to practice as planned with the exception of the one team that was exposed to the COVID-19. Um, the team will not meet for 14 days. Um, I did hear some students complain that in the email that was shared with them that they wanted uh, names and even the team, but I realized that this is uh, an invasion of privacy, but I think appropriate and necessary action was taken. Um, and the student athletes at SHS are looking forward to their upcoming seasons. They're really hoping they will be able to compete in the fall. 
Athletics is really what's sort of keeping people together through the summer. Um, and then with performing arts, uh, the Color Guard has been practicing, and I'm not sure when, but I think band will be resuming soon as well. Thank you. Okay. Any questions or comments? We'll move on to the principal report. Okay, good evening. So um, the coaches and the athletes are continuing with, with workouts this summer. Um, the IHSA has added back in a few restrictions from when they first started allowing less than 50 to be at practices. Um, coaches can still hold practice and a workout with less than 50, but there's no scrimmage or contact. All athletes that are inside must wear masks, so coaches have been very um, smart and diligent about making sure, you know, that they're not running, you know, 50 wind sprints up and down the floor in their mask. You definitely want to make sure everybody's safe. The coaches have been doing a good job. They want the summer to be as safe as possible, and they've done, they're working hard to make sure they keep all the scanning, symptoms, um, temperatures, and are working with the athletes to make this as safe as possible. So hats off to our coaches. Um, as mentioned, we did have our first reported positive case um, with one of the student athletes this summer. Um, the student, yes, because of privacy, we are not you know, announcing student names or what teams, and we wanna keep this as you know, legitimate as possible and confidential. Um, we did, um, the student was asymptomatic, but had been tested due to a possible exposure outside of the school, and the parent was great about contacting us. The process went very smoothly. This was our first time. The coach called athletic director Matt Lauer and myself right away. I contacted the St. Clair County Health Department and related the details. They um, talked me through everything. They also collaborated with the Illinois Department of Health, and then they returned recommendations to us based on the situation. Um, the coach and the parents were contacted with the plan and the quarantine with Dave was backtracked actually to the last two practices that they had. So they are actually only out for one more week. So from I take what I take away from this situation is that every situation is going to be different. It was very important they wanted to know location number of students, if they were distanced, if they had mask on, what kind of activity they were doing. So I could see going forward, whether it's sport or a classroom situation, um, that all these details are going to definitely matter in whatever decision they make or whatever recommendations they give us. Um, the coach in this situation was very organized, detailed, um, communicated greatly with the parents, communicated greatly with Mr. Lauer and I, and I feel like for our first outing of this, because there's a, I feel like there's a lot of unknowns about how all this is going to work, I felt like this went as smoothly as it possibly could, and we'll continue to learn from every situation. Okay. The Department of Health did require names and addresses of those that have been in contact, um, and they are sending out additional notification letters about um, what the possible symptoms could be, what to look for, if they want to get tested, and, and every family would receive a letter from the Department of Health. Um, again, it, it's the best possible, as smooth as, as, it, as it could have possibly gone, and we'll see what happens on the next time, and um, I'm just thankful to everybody who has, you know, communicated all the information and worked with us to make this as the best situation we could. Registration, online registration opened up June 26th for all ninth through 12th grade families. It's the first step um, for all general paperwork. Parents could complete this section, pay fees, and view student schedules. Um, in-person registration is next week, July 21st through July 23rd. The in-person registration is geared more towards ninth grade students. Um, this is their first time that they'll be turning in residency forms, medical forms that we can't you know, get online paperwork for because of confidentiality. Um, they have to bring in birth certificates. So this is more for freshmen. 10th through 12th grade students, unless they have to turn in an updated IHSA athletic form or vaccination or they've moved to a new residence in the district, they really don't need to come to this registration. They can bring those things in anytime before the start of school. They can mail them in. Um, we're gonna have registration set up like we did with the pickup. Everything's gonna be in stations. Socially, everybody's gonna be socially distanced. Um, masks are required to come in for the registration. Anybody that's a new transfer to the district, they have to set up individual appointments with us because we have to get them set up in the entire system, request records from other schools. So hopefully the process will go very smoothly. I've had a number of people volunteer to help work and um, hopefully we get everybody through and, and we'll follow all, all safety precautions. 
And that's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay. Any questions or comments? It's going to be very interesting to see how things go. And, I mean, working as you are with that first case, I mean, I think you guys did a great job. Stay on top. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's move on to the superintendent's report. Okay, uh, real quick, uh, I just have been getting a couple messages from those online. Uh, they're having a hard time here, so if anybody speaks, just you can speak as loud as you can. Uh, Jeff and I have been trying to work through the system. This is not part of my report, by the way. Okay. But Jeff and I have been trying to work through this, and so we've looked at speaker systems. Um, one of the issues we have is, is what we're using right now has horrible feedback. So we're looking at microphones, and so we're hoping to have that um, fixed in the next uh, month or so. So summer work. Um, the custodial staff has been uh, uh, hard at work. Um, you know, unfortunately, they had a head start with the uh, remote learning time that they were able to come in. But uh, our tile project is complete. Um, so if you get a chance, take a look at our cafeteria that doesn't have carpet for the first time since 1988, I think it was. Um, so that's, that's been nice, and there's a couple rooms over here uh, for the abatement um, that has been done. Um, the Mr. Kanaki has been in the wood shop uh, most of the summer. Um, I've apologized to his wife multiple times because she had to put a picture up of him to remember what he looked like because he's up here so often, but uh, he's really transforming that shop. He's gonna take over next year for Mr. Haas and has done a wonderful job. Um, we actually had also some, some of our coaches and our teams came up and have dove into that berm, started pulling weeds, and um, it, it's not perfect, but it's getting there, and so I wanna thank them for the, the time and effort, uh, but uh, we feel like we're gonna be ready for whatever it looks like in August, and uh, so that's, that's good. Uh, we have a return to school committee uh, that has been meeting for the last um, two weeks. Um, we had a, a teacher from each department, staff members, our school nurse, uh, where we've really talked about uh, all the different issues of coming back to school. Um, uh, we, we talked about, you know, how do we get feedback? So we put together some surveys. We have surveys uh, from the staff. Um, I put a survey out to uh, our parents. Uh, got over 500 responses, which I was really happy to see. Um, and so that is gonna help us a little bit. Uh, there'll be a lot more information when it comes to the remote learning portion, uh, because a lot's happened since Monday, since uh, we had our last meeting. Uh, one of the things that has popped up in the state is there are lawsuits now being filed. Um, there was a lawsuit, I believe, it was in Clay County um, and it was filed against Pritzker's orders, um, basically to, to say that all the orders were illegal that he put out. Uh, that county clerk uh, or county court actually ruled in favor of a lawsuit. Um, and so basically, the, the, the ruling said that Pritzker illegally overstepped his bounds, um, but that the IDPH um, or the legislature has the right to make mandates. Um, as of right now, the IDPH has put out some guidelines, uh, but they're not as clear, I think, as they need to be. Um, the, the, the legislature hasn't uh, taken any steps. Um, I believe there is, uh, uh, the Attorney General's office is looking at possibly fighting a lawsuit. I've heard that we should get some kind of information next week uh, on whether or not that will be upheld, um, overturned. Um, so unfortunately, this has kind of been how this whole summer has gone, that we have gotten information um, from one state agency one day, and then we get something else the next day or a week later, and we're trying to figure out a plan, Jill and I and Lori, trying to figure out a plan, and all of a sudden things just get twisted and turned on their head. It's, it's been a little frustrating. And the last thing I have in here is the IHSA, their phases, and again, this is a, another example. They, we were very happy they went into phase two uh, where we were able to actually scrimmage and, and do some skill work is what we would do in the summer anyway. Um, and then they stepped back, so we were not allowed to have any contact. Uh, so they, you know, 
if basketball couldn't scrimmage, football can't have contact, soccer can't have contact. Uh, they required the masks inside, uh, and that actually came halfway in between um, the incident with our team where we had the positive case. They were following the guidelines both sides. So it's just, you know, things have been tossed back and forth. And so it, it's, 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 been a, it's been an interesting summer, but I think we're closer and closer to kind of figuring some things out. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of wait for the rest of the comments when we get to that remote learning. I was thinking that, that too. Uh, any questions or comments for right now? So let's move on to old business. Uh, the first thing is um, we need to amend our 2020-2021 calendar uh, through some of the state legislation uh, that went through in the spring. They mandated that schools must take off on November 3rd. There's a copy of it in your uh, board packet or in your file. Um, that was the day, that was the, the, the day, uh, a Tuesday before we were going to be off that Friday for parent-teacher conferences. So uh, what we've done is basically the three, uh, four superintendents have met. Freeburg Smith and uh, St. Laboria and Freeburg Grade School um, decided the easiest thing to do is we would take that day off. There, there is no um, exemption that schools, uh, even though you don't have elections in your building, you have to take it off. Um, and then we'll add that day on to the end. Uh, so the only bad thing it does is it pushes the last possible day of attendance, assuming we use all snow days, uh, to June 1st. Uh, but I did mention in the write-up that if uh, we do get e-learning days, um, that we would could use e-learning day instead of a uh, an emergency day for a snow day. So that is something we'll have to do, and the board needs to take action to approve that calendar. Okay. Is there any questions about that? If not, we need a motion to approve the amended calendar for the 2020-2021 school year. Motion by Mr. Henning. I'll second. Mr. Parrish? Aye. Mrs. Staub? Aye. Mr. Reynolds? Aye. Mr. Henning? Aye. Mr. Haas? Aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Motion passes. Uh, this is an update on the Health Life Safety Amendment and Health, and health Life Safety Bond Sale. There's a couple issues. Um, first off, we have multiple projects in, uh, along with the second floor addition that qualify for health uh, life safety money. And in order to use money from the health life safety funds, you have to file a health life safety amendment. So the architect has taken the steps to start filing for that amendment. That's about a five or six month turnaround. Um, we can also uh, uh, try to get money uh, over and above what we have in our health life safety fund by selling health life safety bonds. And so that was the second part. So during the uh, uh, building and grounds meeting, we talked a little bit about the health life safety bond sale. And I think the consensus amongst the board is that they would rather uh, look to see, get a little bit closer on what the money is gonna be or the cost is gonna be on the addition before they take the step and commit to selling the health life safety bonds. So I'll do a little work to make sure I get that timing down right. Uh, but we still have a health life safety uh, bond sale that will take place in August and September, and that is from the refinance of the 2011 bond. Uh, so there's no action needs to take place. It's just kind of an update of where we're at on those two issues. Any questions or comments on that item? Okay, let's start. Uh, this is the second reading of these five policies. These five policies all um, relate to Title IX. Um, copies of those were put in the board packets um, I did check, I know uh, Mr. Reynolds had asked about policy for this upcoming school year. We need to have policy. Board member, or, I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, the school's attorney said we do not. Uh, they did also kind of refer back to the whole administrative procedure idea that if we just need to, you know, come up with the rule and, and make that our new rule, we don't actually need a policy. So uh, again, these policies are all from Press Plus. These are required to finish up our work that we did last year with that uh, uh, board committee uh, for the uh, policy. And so we just need a second uh, reading and a, and a final approval. Okay, any questions or comments? We need a motion. Move to approve the second reading and final approval of the policy changes. I'll 
motion. By Angie. Second. Second by Vicki. Mr. Parrish. Aye. Mrs. Stab. Aye. Mr. Reynolds. Aye. Mr. Henney. Aye. Mr. Haz. Aye. Mrs. Miller. Aye. Okay, let's move on to new business. Um, so this is the um, uh, the work that we've done for the consider the return to school plan. Um, I, I would really like to kind of wait till the end to kind of give give my thoughts. Uh, but there are some things that we need to talk about. Um, I think it might be beneficial. I know there's some folks that want to address the board that 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 the board hear what they have to say. Um, I do also know that there's a, a group of teachers that want to kind of address the board and they have a presentation that I'll uh, put up here on the Google Meets. Um, so we want to do the let the teachers go ahead. Sure, let's and, and do theirs first. Go ahead. So our the curriculum uh, committee that has met, our ultimate goal, goal is to get everybody back in school. All students, 700 of them, back here, get everything back to the way it was. We do not want to have to go back to remote learning. Personally, I had very poor uh, attendance for kids coming in and doing work. I don't think we want to go back to that situation. Okay. Uh, we've had a teacher from each uh, department. We've had our school nurse, social worker, um, and the administration has been there to help us basically with information if we had questions. Um, we talked about all the guidelines through the State Board of Education. Um, our the Freeburg Education Association, the teachers have taken a survey, so we kind of we're looking at all the issues we would have and try to come up with some solutions for uh, our back to school plan. Uh, right now, the guidelines, we're gonna have to wear masks, um, students and staff, and I think anybody in the building, uh, require social distancing when possible. Um, one of the biggest issues right now that we kind of talked about is the 50 people in one space. You know, lunchtime um, is gonna be a huge issue for our students whenever we um, that comes up. Symptom screening and self-certification, um, we're going to have to rely on people doing that at home, making sure they're sending their kids here whenever they're not symptomatic, um, and then we're, as a teacher, we're going to have to look for those symptoms as well. Those who had contact with somebody who tested positive for COVID-19 or is suspected of having COVID-19 should isolate at home and monitor for symptoms for 14 days. Close contact means the individual was, was within six feet for more than 15 minutes. If you guys look in some of our classrooms, the desks are stacked right next to each other. If we're gonna fill those classes up with 30, 40 kids, 34 to 36 kids, I mean, if one kid's infected, they're gonna infect six around them. If we, keep, if we don't catch that during the day or they're, they're asymptomatic, seven hours go by, quick math, what is that? 42 kids that's infected in one day. So this is gonna be a huge issue. You know, what happens if this, if there's four or five kids that are symptomatic and it's not caught? We could potentially have 100 in a day get infected. You guys know that. I mean, it's a what if situation, but that would really take a toll. I think the other thing to consider too is the fact that it says that they're suspected of having COVID. So if we have a student who is just symptomatic, and they don't even clarify that. Like, do they have to have a fever? I mean, COVID has like 20 symptoms. If a, symptom, if a student is symptomatic, then any person who's been in, in contact with them for 15 minutes at six feet has to quarantine for 14 days. So it's not even if students are infected, it's if they, if they were with someone that had a, had a symptom. And I think we need to think about that from a teaching standpoint, because if our teachers cannot stay away from the kids, one kid could potentially knock out seven teachers. Again, even if the kid doesn't have COVID-19 or we don't get COVID-19, the guidelines say we still have to quarantine and if you have two kids that do that, that's 14 teachers. We, we don't have enough subs. So that situation could send us back to remote learning without anyone even getting COVID-19. Uh, 
Uh, one of the uh, things we came up with, we were talking to Greg on last Monday's meeting, is the liability insurance does not cover lawsuits from a student or staff member getting COVID. Is that still true, Mr. Franke? Mm -hmm. I'm from Freeburg. I love this town. I went to Freeburg High School. I would hate for our district to be cash strapped because of lawsuits. I have kids that are going to be coming up through here, and I mean, just who knows what's going to happen. Maybe we don't have that situation, but what if there's 10 people that get super sick and our district's liable? I think that would be very detrimental to the future of this district. Okay, so let's go through what we, again, this is the plan that we've come up with that we feel like gives us the best shot at keeping kids in this building. Um, we want to do a situation where the kids are split into three groups. So one group is 100% remote. Those would have to be, for sure, kids that have a medical exemption. And then it would be up to you know, the board and the administration to decide if, if kids have that as an option without the medical exemption. Then you split the kids into two groups by last name, so 50-50. The idea is that the groups come to school alternating, but you only have 50% of the kids in the building. There's a rumor going around that this may be mandated anyway, um, but right now it's a rumor, so we're presenting to you as if we don't know that. Um, again, the whole idea is just to get the numbers down so that all these other things can be implemented. Oops, sorry. That's okay. Okay, so the downside to that obviously is that every student is not in this building every day. Um, that would be ideal. Um, but what we're going to try to do, and I think it is going to be very challenging, um, we're going to try to make it work that even the students who are remote are still following the same class structure. So they still have structure even if they're home. First hour they have to be signed in, second hour they have to be signed in. We don't know how we're going to do that. Um, again, we need to make a decision before we can hammer those details out. So the idea is that we would take attendance, we would have half of the kids in the classroom physically, the other half would be interacting in some way. I think there needs to be some flexibility there though. I don't know that live streaming every classroom every day is gonna be feasible because of bandwidth issues. And what we don't want is teachers wasting a bunch of time because of technical issues. So I think we need to look, leave a little room for interpretation. Like in our meeting, we were talking about, well, maybe we could do instead of live streaming, if, if they're working on something project-based, they could have a message board up. And the kids at home are communicating with the teacher via message board. Or, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different options. Um, but again, we want those kids structured. We want those kids interacting with that class in some way during that class period. Um, it provides structure and accountability um, for those remote learners, which is what we want. So this is really important. Um, I think what's going to be challenging is this. Let me give you guys kind of the scenario. I come to class, I'm in, I'm in class, I get my, the bell rings, I get my 15 kids that are physically in class settled, and I take attendance. Then I get the 15 kids, or 10, or whatever it is, that are doing remote learning signs into Google Meets, okay? And, and we all say hello, and we get started. Then I start teaching or doing whatever I'm planning to do. And then I notice that, oh my gosh, Sally's gone. Sally's gone from the Google Meets. What happened to Sally? But I have these other 20 kids who are, you know, who want, who I'm, I'm trying to interact with and, and engage with. I don't want to stop what I'm doing to try to figure out these technical issues. Because I'll tell you guys, if you lose high schoolers for like 30 seconds, it, it takes about two minutes to get them back. Um, you, you have to keep moving. You have to keep pace. So, you know, I keep going. And Sally, I don't know where Sally went. You know, a couple minutes later, I noticed Sally sent me an email. Um, Coach Kay, I'm really sorry about something happened. My wife and I went down. What do I do? And again, I can stop right then and spend five minutes trying to help Sally figure out what happened, but I'm wasting all of those other kids' time. I would want my, I want my response to be, hey, Sally, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. We have the time at the end of the day every day for me to help remote learners. At 2.45, I'll send you a link for your own personal Google Meets, and I'll catch you up. I think it is, it, it, to make this blended model work, where we are trying to teach kids remotely and in class at the same time, it is imperative that we have time to go back and reconnect with those remote learners. I just don't see how it's gonna work otherwise because those are the kids that are gonna be the easiest to lose um, because they're not with you. you know, it's, it's, it's not as easy for me to see exactly what they're doing. So this schedule would allow for that. Teachers would have a normal work day, 8 to 325. The student day would be from 815 to 245. That would drop five minutes from every class. So they would have a 45 minute class period which I still think is substantial enough that you can get things done. I, I personally think if you get down close to the 30s, then it's really hard um, for classes to be productive. So I think that's 
reasonable. And then from 2.45, at 2.45 the students are dismissed. 2.45 to 3.25 is the dedicated time for teachers to follow up with remote learners. Maybe a kid didn't sign in. You know, maybe a kid went to all of other classes and he was marked absent, and but he didn't sign into your class. You can go reach out to that kid and call home and be like, hmm, what happened? You know, where are you supposed to be? And I, again, I think if we're holding these kids accountable, we need time to be able to do that. And it can't be when the other 25 kids are, are waiting for us to, to move on. Hey, Julie, one other thing I know we discussed. A lot of schools that are going to this model, the A and B model, are taking a full day um, for e-learning for their teachers, whether and, and, a, and a cleaning at the school, whether it be on Wednesday or Friday, some of the some of the people we reach out to, they'll do maybe A B Monday A Monday B Tuesday Wednesday is an e-learning day where the teachers have this time, and, and we want the kids here, we we want them to be here, um, so we think this is a better alternative than losing them for a, for an entire day just to spend a half hour at the end of the day to to catch up, like she said, you know, a kid that that's Wi-Fi went out or somebody who just needs a little bit more time, you know, they may be in class period could ask you a question and just didn't quite have the, the communication with you since they were they were online. So um, while it is a little bit of time at the end of each day, it's not an entire it's not an entire day like a lot of districts are going to. Um, we are suggesting that this plan stay in place through October 2nd. That would be what roughly is a quarter. We don't officially have quarters, but it would be about seven weeks. And that would allow us at that time, you know, if things are good, we don't have cases, everyone's healthy, let's roll, let's get everybody back in here. Um, but my biggest concern is if we're too aggressive when we start, that we're going to end up going back to 100% remote. And I, I feel like that's the biggest thing we need to try to avoid. And this lets us kind of take a stage approach um, and make those decisions informed. You know, has what we've done so far worked? Yes. Great, let's do something else. Or, or no, and let's take a step back. So a couple of things, when, when we first started meeting, um, we were under the mindset, how do we get everybody back in here every single day? Um, obviously as teachers, that, that's what we want. We want to see our kids every day. We want to be teaching them every day. Um, but when we started talking about lunch, we started talking about social distancing in the classrooms. We started talking about uh, the flow of traffic in our hallways. You know, we don't have a ton of, of space. And the, and the answer that kept coming up, well, we can do this, this, and this, we can do that, but the thing that kept coming every single time was, it's gotta be fewer kids, you know, it's gotta be fewer kids. I think our, our lunch numbers were 230 kids, um, so the smallest lunch we wouldn't have would be 115. We figure you can get 50 in the cafeteria and just put the other two numbers maybe here in the library and find one other space. Much easier than trying to find enough space for, for 230 kids to, to eat lunch. And again, while those kids are eating lunch, they're not gonna have their masks on, so. Um, everything that we did to try to figure out on the, on the very first meeting kept coming kind of back to this A-B plan. Um, and then the other thing, obviously, it helps, helps minimize, you know, if, if Timmy has a fever, six kids that sit around him, you know, our classrooms are full, but six kids that sit around him in every single class, um, like Matt alluded to, are, are going to have to be out. And if the teacher's in there, it's a kid up you know, in front of the classroom, the teacher's going to have to go. Um, and, and we don't want that. We, we don't want to... to get here for two weeks and now half our population is quarantined and nobody has COVID, you know, they have a fever or, or, or runny nose or whatever. So um, it gives us our best ability to keep, keep kids here and keep teachers here, keep that great. Um, the, the other thing that I think is great, and, and we talked about this is, you know, we all are kind of worried that we may have to go back. The state may come in at some point, everybody's saying when the weather gets cold again, it's, it's gonna be a big outbreak. This is going to give kids a, an opportunity of, of learning the ins and out of the e-learning. And not just the kids, it's going to give the teachers an opportunity of, of learning the ins and out of e-learning. You know, in the spring, we were kind of, it was kind of thrown at us quick, and everybody did a great job of adjusting on the fly. Um, but this would give the kids and the, and the teachers an opportunity to, to kind of figure it out, know what works best and what, what works best for which kids, find out the, the issues instead of having to find out those issues on the fly if, if and when um, we're mandated to go back to to entire e-learning um, and then gives the district flexibility to safely move to a less restric restrictive model um, before the end of the semester. Julie kind of touched on that. If, if we all come back in the beginning, we may we may be stuck everybody being out. It, this way we can maybe be ahead of the curve a little bit and, and hopefully beat this, this uh, outbreak and, and get everybody back here sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, I just wanted to emphasize, I think, the two things that, if, if you hook nothing out of this, whatever plan we come up with, I really think it's imperative that the teachers have dedicated time to work with, with remote learners. So again, some schools are doing two days, two days, and then one day that's 100%, or you could build it into each day. 
I mean, I had kids in the spring who would get on a Zoom or a Google Meet and they would not talk if the other kids were on it. And then later, if I would go, you know, they just, they're probably the same kids that wouldn't talk in class. You know what I mean? So they were the same kids that, if I didn't have time, if I didn't reach out to them or whatever one-on-one, -on -one, um, they weren't gonna get the help that they needed. So I think if we wanna serve our remote learners well, I think this is important. Um, and again, just to reiterate, we believe this is really the best shot at getting kids back in here and keeping him here. So that's it, we got anything else? No. You guys have any questions for us? Yes, Mr. Honey. Uh, uh, you said Wednesday you go one, I understand the A, B, A, B, but you take one full day, you could, every day you'd have the, the 40 minutes to work with the kids individually, mm -hmm. but one full day, would all the kids be on, or would that day just be devoted to helping individual kids? Sort of one or the other. So we're proposing, there's kids in this building every day. So the first week you'd go A, B, A, B, A. Oh, okay. The second week, B, A, B, A, B. Oh, okay. So the kids are in school five days every two weeks. Good. We're building our one-on-one -on -one time into the end of the day. Right. We were just saying that other schools are handling that by doing, so that's just another option, I guess, that also gives you one-on-one -on -one that I think we can make work. It's one or the other. We're not presenting, we're not doing both. Understood, that's good. Oh, yes. Is it possible, I, I, I'm unfamiliar, is it possible for the kids to be six feet apart during lunch? Um, lunch is a really tough one. Um, the answer is, I don't know. Um, it depends on how many kids we have. Right. It's, it's well, a if we're talking 50, so 50, yes. Yes, 100%. Okay, and will we enforce that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If we have fewer numbers, I, I think we were talking about it earlier, you could do 50 spread out in the cafeteria, you could do some in here, and then, you know, we can discuss classrooms or whatever. I think it's feasible, but I think the key is getting the numbers down. Thank you. I have a question about the, the schedule. As a teacher, I love that kids would be in the building every day and you get to see them more often. As a parent, mm -hmm. and I have a parent, I have a child in every building in Freeburg. Nice. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm interested in all the levels. For sure. Um, that A, B, A, B, A, and then B, A, B, A, B, and then the A, uh, that's, you know, teenagers, What you're going to have kids showing up on the day they aren't supposed to be at school is what I figure, you know, unless you've got your parents really on top of it. Yeah. And then how does... The elementary school and the primary center, you know, kind of like try to line up with that maybe or not line up with that. I'm just curious, teacher wise, yes. Parent wise, oh my gosh, yeah. they, they don't go the same days every week. That would be I hear you. difficult. I think, I mean, the only way to get them the same days each week is if each group's only going two days. Right. So to me, it's more, to me, the struggle of getting them to straighten it out and keep it straight is, is important enough to get them in here three days, that one extra day every two weeks. I mean, I know some schools that do like a different schedule every day of the week, not just normally, you know, like they do the block thing. Yeah. Or they do like my high school rotated. So Monday we started with first hour and then went through Tuesday was second hour. They figure it out. You know, so I, I don't think that would, I don't think you would have to keep track of that as much as you think you would. I think your student would get it eventually. There, there's going to be some mishaps, but I think again, getting them in that extra day is worth the trouble. As far as the grade school go, I don't, that's a question for Mr. Mr. Fraking. <laughs> so we have a meeting set up for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been we've been talking and meeting throughout uh, the remote, and uh, and I, I we we do a pretty good job of trying to uh, you know stay on the same page. Um, so our plan is to try to bring all the information. I know Freeburg Grade School had a special board meeting last week. I think both of them have board meetings next week. Um, we're gonna to try to get together and say, here's what our plans are, what do you guys think? Uh, my opinion is we need to try to figure out what's, how we can stay on the same pace um, for the exact reason that you're talking about. As far as the schedule, I'm talking about older brother, younger sibling, older sister, younger sibling. And um, to me, that's important. And so that's one of the things that I w really want to try to push. And I, I think they're on the same page. I don't wanna speak for them, but um, Again, I'll, I have a few more things after this is all said and done that, that, uh, that I think it addresses what you're talking about. Thank you. By the way, I'm really sorry. We didn't introduce ourselves. Matt did, but we didn't. I'm Julie yeah. Klasinski. I'm a math teacher here. And I'm Matt Lahr. I'm the athletic director and driver's education teacher. Yeah, sorry. My back's in That's okay. <laughs> what about, uh, what happens if a teacher, let's say, is sick, is out for a week? 
you have to bring a substitute in uh, because I sub some at different things. What uh, you know are uh, what kind of problems they're going to present? That's a, is what I'm trying to say. Is the teacher still going to be able to access from home, or are they got to send their plans in and say, "Hey, you need to be doing this"? Like I you usually did with the plans and stuff. Or? I mean, the technological piece of managing business classroom when the kids at home is going to be hard. It's going to be a huge learning curve for us. And I don't know if it's reasonable to think that a sub is going to be able to meet, right. you know, that to put that on them. Um, I mean, I, the way I would see it working is, you know, if that teacher's sick, then we can't expect them to manage learning from home. Yeah. But I do think it's reasonable to send their sub plans to the kids from home. You know, and I think it would just have to be very a lot of independent work. You know, for, I'm a math teacher, so I think math. It would be stuff that they practice stuff that they already learn. You know, in both the classroom and for those remote learners that day. And that was part of our motivation too. We discussed what gives us our best chance to keep people in the building. Again, if if Julie's near a kid who has a runny nose and that's a symptom, she's that kid sits by her desk. She's got to be out for 14 days. Now, she's not sick, so potentially her quarantine, she can do that work. But, you know, one, it's already there's already a few subs. Um, I know you're not uh, an elderly man, but we do have some older subs that may not want to be in a building full of kids. You know, that's certainly something that we took into consideration is how do we keep the kids and the teachers here for as long as we can? And how do we get back to 100% as, as fast as we can? And I think Jill said, too, I mean, I don't know, you know, the health department's going to handle every situation differently. So we're, you know, we're going with what the, the letter of the law says that, yeah, everyone within a six foot race is going to get sent out in quarantine. Maybe it'll be 10 days, depending on the timing of the kid. I don't know, but I think we have to plan for the worst case, and, and that would be what the letter of the law says. But to go back to your original question, um, I don't think anybody would argue that having a sub in place for the teacher is a downgrade in the education. I mean, we've got great subs, but to try to think that a sub can come in and do what our teachers do is just unrealistic. So you know, kind of what they're saying is it's really important that we make sure we keep these guys healthy and in a position where they're not compromised so that we can utilize their skills and their expertise. I agree 100%. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I Thank you for coming. Thank, 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. No, I think you need to speak them. Okay, so my question is um, regarding the 45 minutes at the end of each day, if you end up with, say, I don't know, 50 e learners exclusively, is 45 minutes going to give the students enough time to get access to their teachers each day? And will it in turn give the teachers enough time to address the needs of those students each day? I, I don't know that we can honestly answer the question, and, and, but my opinion is um, anything we do that, that we're not in class 100% uh, of the time, we have to expect that there's going to be something lost. Um, I mean, our teachers will do the best they can to contact kids and, and be in contact with kids, but you know, we just need to be realistic that uh, there's going to be um, learning that is lost with any time you're doing any kind of remote. Um, but they, they will do their best. And again, uh, I don't know how much you guys heard, I know you were chatting a little bit about, uh, you couldn't hear, there are some other alternate um, uh, 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 remote learning or blended learning uh, models that would give more time for teachers and students to interact. But they have drawbacks because they're taking a little bit less time out of class. But there are other models that would allow that to happen. Anybody else? Mr. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've got okay, a whole bunch of questions. Oh, hold on, we got somebody. Go. Okay. Sure. Okay, so uh, just so I'm clear, face masks are going to be mandatory for the kids, correct? We're we're gonna we're gonna cover that. Okay. Uh, will there be enforcement in place if face mask requirement is not required? We'll cover, we'll cover that. that. Yeah. Okay. Are we going to sanitize the kids' hands before each class and desks? Say that again. Are we going to make the kids sanitize their hands and desks between each class? We, we have not worked through all that. We have ordered additional sanitizers. Okay. Um, we ordered them back in March, and they're still back ordered, so we're, we're going to get things in as soon as we can. Uh, but we will, we will follow the guidelines as close as we can uh, as far as the sanitation. Um, unfortunately, high school kids, we have to, you know, they're going to have to do a lot of this on their own, and we'll do the best we can to enforce it. But, uh, you know, our goal is that nobody's walking around with germs, and whatever we can do to help out, we will. Okay. Uh, how will we be notified as parents if there's a positive case here for your? Um, so, kind of run through what we did. We had a, a sports team that had a positive case. We contacted the, everybody that was involved. Um, and then we sent out a generic um, email saying this is what happened. And, uh, you know, we are, we are confined by privacy rules. And so we can't give as much information as everybody wants. Uh, but we will give you as much information as we're legally allowed to give. Um, so I don't know if you've got the I you have the child here now. I, I'm sorry, I have two children here. Okay, so did you get the email that yes. we sent out? Okay, yeah. It'll be something similar to that. Okay, great. And, and if you are, if your child was in the the group, then you would have been contacted with a lot more information. Okay, great. Uh, what will happen to an educator if they do not enforce mask rules? If if, if, that, if that is a policy, then it would be just like anything else that they have, have been directed to. It, it would be a con considered insubordination, and, and, and there's things that we would do for a teacher that's insubordinate. Okay. Thank you. Sarah, yeah. do you have another one? It was just more of a question. I, you all kind of addressed it as far as the question about having different kids at different schools. I, I don't have kids in daycare. Um, but, you know, I have three children between Smithton and then two at the high school now. Um, my feeling on the alternating three and two is that that's going to be very confusing for families and students, as the other person said, especially if you've got children on alternating schedules. Um, so just as a suggestion, I don't know how realistic it is or if it would even, you know, be considered. But if we could have kids on a consistent Tuesday, Thursday, or Monday, Wednesday with Friday e-learning schedule or something along those lines so the kids are on consistent two days, that would be a lot easier to manage from a parent standpoint if we have to do a blended model with the distance learning. Maybe we consider on Monday, as someone has, goes every Monday and every Wednesday and then there's one that goes every Tuesday and every Thursday and then every other, then both of ones do every other Friday. We're, we're going to work to figure out what we think is going to be the best to make it the simplest to follow and whatever we do um, yeah and I, I think all I know all four superintendents are meeting tomorrow I think we're all committed to make sure this I mean because this is just a, a really not so mess. nice okay. issue and so we're trying to figure out what works the best because to be quite honest if it doesn't work out smoothly um, Jill's gonna get a lot of phone calls <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I mean it, we want it to work the best that we can. Yeah, so I, I, I understand what you're saying and I agree. And so we, we understand those things. Any other questions? Mike, you have a question? Okay. things I'll talk about is uh, some uh, additional professional development and one of the things that we've been talking about in our committee is moving more towards the Google Classroom um, and, and a little bit away from some of the other um, apps 
Um, trying to consolidate the apps that we use and not have so many teachers use so many different apps because it just, can, you know, it's a little more confusing for the kids. And so that's something we want to try to train the teachers to use one particular uh, system so it makes it easier for everybody. And can those uh, Google Classroom sessions be, be recorded? Yes, it can. Okay, so and that's what I'm kind of thinking toward. I absolutely understand the issue with not wanting to stop during the class and you know, try to troubleshoot someone who's having a technology issue, but if the entire lesson is recorded, then that at least gives that student a chance to go back Yes, it absolutely does. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Mr. Frickin, there was a type. I have a question, Greg. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm a teacher. I'm 60 years old. I am at high risk of contracting COVID-19. I'm willing to return to the classroom as long as safety measures are followed. One of the big questions that I have is the 45 minute periods. Uh, I want to know if we're going to add people to come into the classroom. And you have to understand the high school is very different from grade school and junior high. Our kids come in and out of the classroom every 45 minutes. And I want to know what kind of safety measures and what kind of measures could be taken to clean the classrooms after each hour? Is that something that's being taken into consideration? Um, we've discussed it. Um, the feasibility of cleaning every classroom after every hour, I'll be honest, I don't know that it's a possibility by our custodial staff. It may be a situation we're gonna have to have cleaning supplies and allow, um, the students or the teachers to wipe the desk down. Uh, I don't know, um, but um, we, we have been using a, a machine that's a misting machine. It's actually recommended now. Um, and we've been using it for probably over a year. And, and we've been using that nightly um, where you can mist and you don't have to actually touch and wipe down everything, just the mist lands and kills the germs. But, the, but we are gonna to have to look at all those uh, uh, aspects and, and try to come up with a plan. Thank you. Are you planning on having that plan in place before school starts? Yes. And you'll let us know what it is? <laughs> sure. Anybody else have any questions? I just had a, a They were put in the public packet, so you could actually, you should be able to see those if you go online and look at the, the public board packet. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. At the grade school uh, board meeting last week, um, it's kind of become my summer theme of attending board meetings, but, um, <laughs> they mentioned there was a nurse supplier, she supplies for hospitals, they were talking about the wipes and they're going to have enough wipes to be able to start school so that we could clean things and wipe things off. And, she was saying, because she supplies them for hospitals, that they're almost non-existent. They're having a hard time. I know we got our supply list, and they want hand sanitizer and Clorox wipes, which I haven't seen in months. Um, so my question, I guess, would be, if you can't get those things that are back ordered, and if you can't have those supplies, just what just will get called off because we can't clean in between? I'm just curious, like, you know, that kind of thing, keeping it in the mindset of what if we don't have the things to complete the sanitation that we need to complete? Right. So, so we have the supplies for the mister, and we have uh, hand sanitizer in large containers. We're still waiting for the smaller ones, and we we'll, and our plan was to put them by each door. So as, as kids would go in a door or out a door, they could use the hand sanitizers. They're spread out. We have three or four in the cafeteria. Uh, those those were able to get in. Um, there's a few things that. You know, we're just not sure if we're going to get them in on time. Um, I think some of those are over and above what the 
um, the, the additional cleaning that we've been doing. Um, so, you know, just like everything else, we're gonna have to probably make a decision real close to the start of school that if we don't feel like we can bring people in and keep them safe, we may have to make a decision. This stuff's backward until August 30th. You know, can we safely get the kids in? And, and I don't really have an answer for you to say yes, we would or yes, we wouldn't right now. But, but that's not to say that we are not sanitizing now. And, and I would almost, I don't want to bet, because I don't want to lose money, but that this school is pretty darn clean. And, and the, what they do and the sanitizing they do with the machines that we have right now, it, it is a very clean school. And uh, so it, it's, it's, I think it's gonna be a very safe place to come into. Probably just as safe as most households if the kids are leaving. Mr. Brady, there's some questions in the chat about why high school students would need to rotate versus having teachers rotate. Um, so in the grade school, they talked a lot about having the teachers rotate. And, and the reason it works in the grade school is because teachers teach multiple subjects. And so you have a, a teacher that teaches uh, history and English and, um, uh, and, and that would work because those kids stay together. So the seventh, seventh grade A class, whatever it's called, they stay together so that teacher can kind of ro rotate through. At the high school, um, we've got as many schedules as we have kids. So the idea that we could keep those same, let's say 30 kids in a classroom and the teachers rotate because those, those 30 kids have probably 15 or 16 different teachers the next hour because they're going from first hour English the second hour algebra and and the other one's going from that English class the, the industrial arts and English the, it, it, it just physically doesn't work it just won't work in high school that way so the kids have to rotate and I haven't heard of a high school that that, that is having teachers rotate and kids not it just doesn't work was there other one that's the only one I really saw that was brought up that wasn't addressed yet So, I have, uh, for those that are new to board meetings, except for you, <laughs> the expert now. Um, so I write things to the board, and some of the uh, questions that, um, that I think we need to really think about and kind of, kind of come up with a decision, um, if you go through what the state says on these, these uh, return to school plans, it says that the superintendent has a responsibility to develop the plan. Um, and I, I obviously am going to look at the board for direction. So this isn't anything where I'm going to develop a plan and say this is the plan, hope you like it. Uh, but one of the things, and Matt had brought this up and I kind of wanted to clarify as far as the liability insurance. So we have a liability insurance carrier. Uh, we're in a cooperative. There's probably 40 or 50 schools in it. Um, the, the emails that I've gotten from them is there isn't a insurance company in the state of Illinois that will cover or, or any kind of COVID lawsuit. Uh, but we do have what's called tort immunity. So we can use our tort fund to pay for a lost lawsuit. Uh, the, the key there is we can do that unless we're willfully or wantonly negligent. And, and to be willfully or wantonly negligent, we, we basically have to not follow the guidelines that the state agencies tell us that we have to follow. So um, if the state agency says, you need to wear masks, and we say, you don't need to wear masks, and then somebody gets COVID and they sue us, our tort is not gonna pay for it. So that will come directly out of our funds. And that is something that, we're, that I'm very aware of, that I wanna make sure we're following what those guidelines are um, honestly, to protect the school financially. So uh, that being said, um, and I have recommendations, I don't, we don't need to vote on any of this, it's just really uh, um, um, kind of direction from the board. Um, I have seen where school districts have put together resolutions and passed a resolution. I did not include a resolution tonight, so we can't pass any kind of resolution. 
Um, and the board can meet again if we want to look at a, a complete plan, the board approve a complete plan, we can have a special board meeting. But kind of get this work together, and again, we're going to work uh, meet Monday with the teachers again. But I don't think any of us think that the, the not having a mask is even feasible. So I think our opinion is that you have to have a mask when you enter the building. If you ride the bus, you have to have a mask to get on the bus. Um, that if you don't have that, um, you're, you're not going to be able to enter the building. Um, it would be the consequence would be similar to any other consequence in the handbook. Um, you know, it, it may be to the point where we'd have to work with the parents and you know and, and put that uh, student on a remote plan as opposed to allow them to come in person. So, um, you know, these are the things that I think we need direction from, or I would like direction from the board. And I'd like to break it down a little piece by piece instead of trying to take everything all at one time. Um, and I know we haven't been wearing masks at board meetings. It felt like we really needed to, to start wearing masks. Um, um, I don't enjoy it at all, but it's the world we live in. So I don't know if anybody had any comments on that or anything that we should or shouldn't. That's not what we want to do. Well, at this point, they should be used to masks. You can't get into Walmart anymore without a mask. You can't get into businesses without masks. Getting into school where Is a school, what happens if someone comes and does, gets a mask, is a school responsible to furnish a mask for the student? We, we respond, we're going to have a mask, in other words, uh, say a mask uh, it breaks, it snaps. So what as, as a practice, mm -hmm. I do not want us to be the supplier of the mask. Okay. Realistically, we are going to have to have a supply of masks for that exact thing. Um, kid gets sick. You know, we want them to have a mask. Um, you know, kids do mess up and forget their mask. So, um, there, there was masks offered from the state. I put in for those. Um, I don't know if they've come in. Hopefully, they will. But so it, it is a, a fairly large quantity. So we'll have some. But again, I do not. Responsible. Yeah. I do not want us to be the supplier of masks. Okay. Yeah. But we have them, and uh, uh, you know, they break or get get sick and injured. Right. Or like right. That. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next thing, uh, big decision is the whole temperature check. Um, some districts uh, are, are trying to take temperatures at the door. Um, other districts are doing what's called pre-certification. Um, in our group, or our, our group that we met with the teachers, uh, we're leaning more towards the pre-certification. The concern with the temperature, taking the temperature is a couple things. One, it's only one of the um, uh, symptoms of COVID. There's other symptoms, and then you have to do a questionnaire. But the logistics of, of stopping kids before they come in, then the kids line up, you take the temperature, then they come in the building. So at what time do you have to get those kids' temperature taken so they can get them into class on time? Where do they go? Who supervises them? Um, Let's say you have a student that gets on the bus, if they ride the bus, what the, you're supposed to do is take the temperature before they get on the bus. So the bus driver takes the temperature and little Johnny is 100 whatever, it's too high. Well, now what do you do? So now the bus has to wait because we can't leave the kid there. So now the bus has to wait. It just seems like there's a lot of logistic issues with the temperature check. The pre-certification, um, there's just this week, there, uh, I was, shown two different apps. Uh, Crisis Go has an app. Now we don't use Crisis Go, but we do use School Messenger and that's what we send those messages out. Um, I've tried, I'm scheduling a meeting with uh, their representative next week. So basically it would be on the parents to certify that they have taken the temperature. Uh, we contacted a lawyer. We can't do a sign off at the beginning of the year and say, I will check my child's temperature every day. The, the, her interpretation is we're gonna, the, Whoever does it has to be done on a daily basis, whether we do it or the parents do it. Um, we want to put that, um, that job on the parents. They would do that normally if their son or daughter doesn't feel well. Um, so uh, they would get on and ask their phone and hit, we check the temperature. 
Um, it brings up issues, what happens if they don't press the app and we get, you know, John or Susie at school and they didn't have the app click that they had, took their temperature, then we're gonna have to go find them, take their temperature. So there's, it, it, it's not easy either way, uh, but we're kind of leaning towards the pre-certification. Um, and then we looked at, uh, talked a lot about the schedules. Let me jump to, that'll be last because that's probably Big decision. Uh, we talked a little about the lunch rooms. Um, we do feel like we've got enough room in the lunch room in the library. We can set up tables. The lunch room's right here. Uh, we could set some tables up down the ramp and get. We feel like we have enough room to get the separation. In fact, we could probably put a couple different. We could probably spread kids out a little more in the cafeteria than we think. Uh, so we feel like we have enough room to do that. Uh, the lunches will be, we will, know, we will not have any self-serve lunches. Uh, we'll work with OPA on that. So it'll probably be more like a box lunch or a bag lunch um, than it will be necessarily where they can go and scoop whatever, that, none of that'll happen. We have to put up barriers around the lunch workers, especially the cashiers because the kids are in close proximity. We'll put the X's down. We'll have super, supervisors there remind kids we've got the sanitizing. So. We feel like uh, if the numbers are in order, that we can handle the lunch. Uh, the hallway traffic is another area where we really need to pay attention to kids gathering and congregating. Uh, so what we are talking about doing is all of our north and south hallways, we're gonna make one direction. Put arrows, we'll put some signs up uh, where, you know, they have, if they're going south, they have to go one hallway. If they're going north, they have to go the other. The east and west has all the classrooms on it. They're going to have to be two-way. We'll put some tape down. Again, we're just going to have to work with our teachers to try to you know, keep an eye on kids. Please don't stand, talk, keep moving uh, as best that we can. Um, one of the things we had talked about was limiting the use of lockers or possibly uh, uh, allowing students to use their backpacks. Um, I think the consensus was in our group that they really didn't want the backpacks brought back into the classroom. Um, and then, so then the idea was to possibly stagger when kids would use their locker. So freshmen could go to the locker, or freshman, sophomore could go to the locker after first hour, juniors and seniors after third. And so, you know, you would try to get those classroom supplies. And again, the idea is just, you know, try to eliminate as much as we can. Um, and I'm sure whatever we do, we're gonna have to alter it. As we as we move forward, you know, and as, as we go through this plan, um, anybody have any questions on those? Yes. What what what's going to be the plan when they arrive at school? Because a lot of them meet in the cafeteria. Or so they happen? won't be able to meet in the cafeteria. They'll, so will the they plan go straight to their classroom. I think the plan's going to have to be they're going to have to go straight to their classroom. Okay. So they go to the locker, get their supplies, go to their classroom, uh, and so then we'll have to work with the teachers on. What time is that? And if that's before their contractual time, then we'll have to sit down and work with them. Or we don't allow students to arrive into, until a certain time. Yeah, and, and we don't have that worked out yeah. yet. Okay. But, but that was the idea that yes, they can't, because they sit on the ramp or they yeah. go in the cafeteria. Yeah. We're not gonna be able to do that. Um, rules for restrooms, how, how is that? Do we get ideas on how that's gonna be handled yet? I mean, I mean, you can't keep the kids moving. No, it, it's it, it's gonna. We're just gonna have to be a, probably a little more strict than we are now, and really pay attention to who's in the restroom. Um, you know, really focus on the kids, not to congregate in the restroom. I know we we are going to have to make some modifications, especially in the boys' restroom, right. because not all of our urinals have the partitions. So right now, the idea is we're going to. Um, decommission <laughs> we're gonna make a box and like put it over the urinal so they right. can't right. and then separate the urinals okay. um, but south end they all have uh, I know sorry girl <laughs> uh, but the south end they do have partitions uh, but the rest they don't like here so so I talked to Dennis this week and we're gonna have to okay. yeah we'll have to do some things like that uh, same thing with sinks we'll probably have to put something over a sink um, yeah okay.
Oh. Yeah. Uh, so the next thing, uh, and again, it may be a, a moot point. Uh, maybe I'll uh, I'll talk about it now. So, uh, rumor came out yesterday, or what, what day was it? Uh, yesterday morning, that the state is going to be mandating a 50% occupancy max in school. Um, and, and you know you hear rumors through the state and you know you kind of get a feel of how strong that rumor is and how you know th this is a pretty strong rumor and if anybody listened to the governor's um, address yesterday uh, he said a lot of things that seemed to push that idea that schools are going to be limited to 50 percent and so if schools are limited to 50 percent then obviously we're going to have to look at an alternate schedule because we don't have the room in our school to spread kids out. Um, we're, we're pretty close to capacity. So um, that being said, the whole, my next point was remote learning. Um, and, and the law is that if you can provide uh, all in-person instruction that the school district does not have to provide remote learning. Uh, if parents didn't want to send their kids uh, in person, they could homeschool them. Well, I think that's gonna get thrown out the window along with the whole uh, full capacity. So um, one of the things with the remote learning, and I, I, I'd like direction from the board, but I think this is going to land on uh, my desk and Jill's desk and Lori's desk on, you know, the, a doctor certification. Um, I guess the big question is, if we do an A-B schedule, obviously kids are going to be remote half the time, but there is going to be a group of students that are either compromised or for whatever reason are going to want remote and so um, I guess a decision needs to be made obviously if a doctor comes in and says that uh, you know Susie can't be at school because of a health issue we, we're going to have to accommodate that just like any other but if, if, if a parent says I just don't feel comfortable I don't want my kid going um, the school district doesn't have to allow that. It's just how much, you know, you're gonna have kids remote anyway, so we could then, and I think Julie's group mentioned that, I think you call those the R kids. Mm -hmm. So those are the remote kids. So I do think we, we need to probably have that option. Um, and again, you know, hopefully it's more of a doctor's note and not just uh, that they just don't wanna come. but those kids would then be remote all the time. So the one thing that, that I think uh, I'd like direction from the board is if a student, if a parent or a family decides that that person needs to be a remote 100% of the time, the state says they can't participate in driver, the, the driving course of driver's ed. The other two things I think really need to be uh, emphasized as well is they can't, you know, hopefully there's extracurricular, but they should not be able to participate in extracurricular activities. Um, if, if they're not able to come to school for health reasons, I think those same health concerns would be in an extracurricular. And the same thing would be for you know a dance or anything like that. And, and the other thing that we really think needs to happen is that there needs to be a minimum time. Uh, I know the, the, the teachers group said a quarter. Uh, we had mentioned a semester. Um, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts one way or the other. I, th I think the families that are making that decision, I don't think anybody's making it lightly. Um, I think if you said they had to be remote for a semester, I don't think that would be a huge burden on them. I think they would be, understand that. Um, so those are a couple things that, you know, they should be able to participate in extracurricular and it probably needs to be for a certain length of time. So I don't know if anybody had any thoughts. I do, I was gonna say, I think Especially for an A B plan, we should absolutely allow parents who are uncomfortable having their children come to school, allow, be part of that remote group um, and get the, the instruction that they think. I personally wouldn't want my student doing that because I know how much we can be learned this spring and I would be embarrassed to send her out in the world with that knowledge that she needs. Um, not because the teacher didn't do well, but because my student didn't do well being separated. Um, but I think there are some legitimate reasons that don't 
don't just have to do with the student. Maybe they live with a person who's very high risk, or maybe they interact with someone who's high risk all the time. I think that parents' decision has to account for something. Um, I definitely want my student in school as much as possible, but I, I don't think I can make that decision for someone else. And I think, especially if we're doing the AB and those lessons are already being made up, I don't see a reason why we can't let those kids and those parents make that decision for them. I agree that we should be, okay, it's a, it's a I like the October 7th reevaluation time, um, but have those students be okay till October 7th when we reevaluate re how we're gonna do our plan. Um, you, if you choose, you opt out, you're opt out, opting out for that entire time. That way the teacher doesn't have to think about different ways of doing those things and they know what to expect along with the student. Um, I also absolutely agree that if they're opting out of school, then you, you're opting out of uh, those extracurriculars and those dances and things too, because they're all the exact same health risks. So you think just the, the quarter and not the full semester? Well, I think there's a re-evaluation re at the quarter. It maybe it does extend, extend it into the full semester, but at the quarter, we evaluate and see, okay, how is this going? Um, is still stuff's getting worse? Do maybe we do? Or does the state say we have to close down? We don't have a choice right. at that point. Um, but I think I'm, I'm very much with the teachers, and, and I like their ideas. My personal opinion in the beginning was maybe even the, the move up and get them out for lunch too. But with half, I, I think I understand with half the half the more people here and splitting them up to different rooms, it doesn't concern me so much about lunchtime, and that was my concern with too many kids at lunch with the moving up thing, so I like what the teachers have put together. Okay. Any other comments over here? My, my comment, uh, as being an ex-teacher, is how much more time, preparation time, is this gonna take? You've got a, a live class, you've got calls here. I mean, uh, you know, it's not like you're just preparing for one thing. You're preparing for online, you're preparing for actual uh, contact, uh, what? How much? You know, with the e-learning, at least you had one preparation to do. Now it, it's you, you're faced with a couple of different problems. I see. Yeah, I mean, all the plans that I feel like the teachers went through, this was honestly the worst one from a workload standpoint for us. That's, I do think it's the safest, but I really, I think it's going to be. I think it's best for the kids, but I, I do think it's going to be. I, um, you know, I think some teachers are more set up already um, to do it than others. So it's gonna be a teacher by teacher basis. But I know for myself personally, with math, I like to see the kids work. So they, you know, they do paper worksheets. So I'm gonna to have to make all those into an electronic form for the kids that are online, which is which is fine. But I mean it's gonna be a lot of work, Mr. Honey. But you know, I I think we just know that and we're gonna do the best that we can to Well I, I agree but I, I I also think that uh you know, you need a little recognition, or, or at least from my standpoint of view, you, you're taking on a, a lot of, lot more load than usually you had under those circumstances. Yeah, I appreciate and that. I, I, I do think, think that our faculty and the people that agree to it, I, I think that's tremendous. I do think everyone needs to recognize as well that, I mean, there's going to be a learning curve. Like the first week, I mean, it's going to sure. be, it's going to be rough. And you know, Mr. Freaking said, you know, if we cut down on time. You know, every every minute you lose of class time, you you know, I, I guess what I'm saying is I think the teachers are gonna have to look really hard at their curriculum and make sure that we're hitting what we have to hit and, and some things that aren't necessarily standards or some of the extra things that we do are gonna have to go because I, I think with a shortened class period plus, I just think we're gonna be less efficient since we're managing both at the same time. You're just not gonna get through the same amount of material that you normally would. And I think we just have to acknowledge that and do the best that we can. That's a, a concern of mine is I think we're kidding ourselves if, if you, we expect a remote learning uh, session or methodology to, to have the same rigor, the same curriculum, cover the same points, and produce the same, the same results as what a, a live teacher and a student in front of. Uh, it's, Either the curriculum is going to be dumbed down, or the standards are going to be lowered, or the results just aren't going to be uh, aren't going to be sufficient. And those are my concerns uh, with with trying to accomplish this. Uh,
are you planning on on any type of extra uh, technical positions any e-learning extra extra personnel uh, to facilitate I, I, I say that only because I know other other school districts have brought people on uh, we, we hired the extra aid and, and that was to help out with for the academic lab that was to help out with the kids that were struggling from the last remote learning mm -hmm. So I imagine we will incorporate our aids because the, the, the academic lab is a lot smaller. So I don't know that we'll need those aids in there, especially for half the population. So, so we'll probably use that. Uh, and then Gary, I'm, I'm gonna address your concern a little bit when I get back to the schedule and kind of throw my thoughts in. So I, I, I think it, it, it might address some of your, your concerns. As far as the technical part, uh, no, we had not planned on um, adding any staff. Uh, the thing that we, and I'll, I'll bring this up now, it's probably a good time, is the state in the new plan allows you to use five additional professional development days um, in your school year. And, and they gave it to us last year, we used it at the end of the year with teacher collaborating, kind of talked about this coming school year. So one of the things we would like to do is probably push back when the students return a day or two or maybe three. Again, that's a big discussion we're gonna to have tomorrow when we meet with the superintendent, what's gonna work best. But that will allow us to sit down with staff and really look at the technology part of it and, and how can we do, because one of the biggest issues we had last year with the staff was assessment. How do you give a kid an assessment online and feel like you're getting a true picture of what that student knows knowing that you're not there watching them write it on the piece of paper, that, that you're trusting them. So there's some things that we could do. Um, and Jeff's got a really good grasp on it. So that's one of the things that we're talking about doing is, is trying to really put a day or two. We already have two days, one is the freshman orientation. So if we move that back a day or two, that would give us about two or three days that we could really sit down with staff and really talk in depth about what kind of technical, what can we use technically that will help them out, um, you know, the whole Google Classroom uh, aspect as opposed to using a Zoom or using uh, TeacherEase, there's a couple of uh, 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 platforms that teachers use to really kind of uh, make or, or streamline uh, lessons and it'll help the teachers, it'll help the kids. And so that's kind of what we're looking at to try to hit that at the very beginning. And then we have the ability to use those, those uh, in-service days uh, and also if, if we would do one of those AB days where there's a remote day, there's additional time in there. But the, 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 again, I, I thought I said it earlier, the idea that any form of remote, that we're not gonna lose something is, is just, sure. you know, it's well, I just, it's just I not think gonna happen. I'm, I'm married to an educator, so uh, I know the planning that goes into regular lesson plans to, in front of kids. To expect a uh, our, our teachers to prepare for that in person, and then go home at night or something and do something for a, a remote learning also that extra burden, it's just it cannot happen. Uh, you know, their best intention may to do it, but that's there's you're looking at burnout. I don't disagree. Yeah. That. Greg, just this is Mike. If I can get a chance. Sure. So, my personal opinion is it needs to be the parent's decision of whether kids come to school and do remote learning. Um, the subject you're talking about right now, I think all classes should be recorded. And I don't know why we can't use our website to post those, which would help. Um, I think the additional time, either at the end of the day or the separate day, would fill that gap. I think that most people that keep their kids at home are going to be pretty serious about it, and I think that they will help the process. I also struggle with the um, parents saying that the temperature was taken. I, I'm very concerned about that one. I don't know that, I mean, from a liability standpoint, yeah, it probably helps. But the reality is, I don't know that people will do the due diligence every day. I just want to share some of my thoughts on some of the stuff you guys have been talking about. Okay. All right. Did you? Sure, I think you have 
something. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I agree with them that we need to have the option to do remote learning. Uh, me, for example, I'm a professional pilot. I'm exposed to a lot of people. And if I were to become symptomatic, I need to be able to keep all of your kids safe by keeping my kids at home. That means I need remote learning. That's just being responsible. So I agree. Okay. Uh, so then I wanted to go back uh, and kind of talk about the, the days. Um, so in the last day and a half or whatever it's been since the, the rumor started, um, the my focus has been absolutely on an AV type of a schedule, and, and I agree with some of the comments that were made. Um, uh, and, and, and I was there when they talked about the early release. I don't think it's enough time. Um, we used to do an early release on Wednesdays and it just, it's hard to get anything done to get the kids out of here to get things started. I really think we need to look at an AB with a, um, a consistent day that we do remote, whether we do it on a Wednesday. And my thought was Wednesday because then it splits it up. You do AB Monday, Tuesday, you do AB, Thursday, Friday, Wednesday you do your remote, um, but I could be talked into doing the remote on Friday. Um, but I do think that's the time where teachers can really, uh, whether they, they get a group of kids on a, on a Google Meets or they meet individually with a kid on a Google Meets, um, they can have time to work on their lesson. Um, you know, like it or not, we're, we've been thrown into a situation that just pretty much stinks. And so we have to figure out what works best and, and keep our, our kids in mind. Uh, but we also have to keep everybody else in mind. And I, I just think this is going to help us get started. Um, I have a bad feeling that it's going to go the other way. Um, my sister just texted me. She's a teacher. And she, she, she said she heard a rumor that Pritzker is going to announce remote learning from the start of the school year. So... I haven't heard that first time I've heard it. Hope it's not the case. But um, I really think that's the direction we need to lean towards. Um, I know we're going to sit down tomorrow, and, and we've had these conversations with the grade school. I, I I think the best I could say is I think they're open to it. I don't want to you know say what their decision is, but I, I know I think all of us are in the same boat that we want to make sure that everybody stays on the same page, um, just for the family's sake to try to make things as easy as possible in a really, really difficult uh, situation. So um, those seem to be like the biggest issues that we're having, and I really wanted to kind of get the direction from the board. I appreciate all the, the parents, and I know I think I saw a kid or two on there. Um, I, I appreciate everybody's you know opinion. Uh, if you want to look at what the uh, uh, survey said, it's not in line with what I'm recommending now, but um, Two days changed everything, it seems like, and who knows what two more days are going to do. So, I don't know what other the board members' thoughts are. Let me, let me add, Julie, mm -hmm. I like your proposal, but I like, I like his better from the standpoint of view. I think it gives the teachers more time to prepare and more chance, you know, and uh, to solve the problem of AD Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and off Friday. But wouldn't that be much easier on you as a teacher? Yes. I mean, you're looking at it from a student standpoint, but we're going to lose something somewhere, no matter what. And I think yeah. I think you might gain what you thought you would gain by having the extra kids by, especially if you have a lot of remote learning and stuff like this that you can carry on. Yeah, I think I like, you I, 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 I like your... Well, well I'm going to be honest, Gary. This was not my idea. My idea Monday was we need to be here. Yeah. And um, and then when they brought up the idea of doing a um, alternate schedule, early schedule, I liked that. And they brought up the early release. And I thought, oh, we could do that. And then they said something about, oh, well, you know, every Wednesday and Friday. And I went, what? And so it was not my idea. <laughs> I've... I, thought about it and things have happened and had conversations and so I can't take credit for it. That that came from the teachers group. So I want to make sure they have the credit. But it, it's, you know, I think it would be hard to argue that that is not 
the best thing to do at this time. Uh, trying to alter the schedule to an early release or an early start. You know, our parents are kind of used to having kids here at a certain time. They, a lot of them work their work schedule around that. So to me, that seems unfair. Uh, we actually started to talk about having the high school go early and then get out early to try to get them out before lunch. Um, and we had the transportation worked out. It was all gonna work out fine, but the more we thought about it, the more we thought we're gonna have conflicts with our grade schools and, and with those kids and either, you know, who's watching who and, uh, and it just didn't seem, it, it just seemed like it was gonna cause more problems than worse. So they came up with a great idea that I just wasn't smart enough to <laughs> agree to right away. And, but no, it, I, I, I think it, it solves a lot of issues. And I will also tell you that we're probably gonna start getting phone calls tomorrow about how this is the most horrible idea that we've ever had in our entire lives. And, Nope. So, so we have a couple options, I think. Um, one of them is we can put a plan together and just put it out there. If the board wishes, we can have a meeting and put the plan together, have the board approve the plan, uh, because there's a lot more to the plan than just what we're talking about. Um, that would require a um, special board meeting, which probably needs to be done next week or, or the week after at the latest. Um, I, I feel comfortable with us having the direction we have to put a plan together. I think that everybody is, is okay with, at least from what I'm hearing from the folks that are here. So it's, it's kind of up to you guys. If you want, state doesn't require the board approval. What are your thoughts? See, my concern is I've been dealing with this all summer. I've year-round with early childhood mm -hmm. program that I have. And the rules, constantly changing, the guidelines are changing, the recommendations are changing. We can come up with this great plan next week and the board can approve it, but then change. it'll change the next day and then we're gonna have to do it all over again. So I'm not sure how we can come up with a solid plan because we could we could have this great plan in place and we start school on Monday and they come up with new recommend recommendations on Wednesday. And I mean, any time during all this, it's gonna change. And I don't know which direction it's going to go. So it's hard to say, yeah, let's have a board meeting. Let's make the plan. Let's, let's approve it. But it's going to change. But change. I, think, I think you've got to have a plan. Well, I know. Well, I'm saying no, that. That's, not what, she's she's that's not what I'm saying. No, I'm not saying we can come up with a plan, but I don't think we need to have a stamp of approval on it. We need to be very, very, very yeah, flexible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure sure flexible. Yes. And, and we have another meeting scheduled Monday with our group. And so we can kind of, now that we have a direction, and that was one of the big things that we really talked about the last meeting is we really need a direction, especially the schedule uh, of, of what we're gonna do. Then we can kind of really work out some of these other things. Uh, you know, do we have time to do the checks? Or, or how are we gonna get that done? Um, what, what are we gonna do with kids once they get here? And so those are a lot of things that we also have to, to work out. You know, do we, do we not do the backpacks? Do we alternate, you know what I mean? So there's still a lot of the, dotting the I's and crossing the T's kind of stuff that needs to happen. The brainstorming is fantastic though because there's so many different scenarios yeah. you have to hit. So we'll, we'll meet again. I will, I'll, I will, I'll get what I can out to you guys. You can, you know, I can talk to you individually about your thoughts and then we can, um, I'll talk to Doug about whether we need to schedule another meeting or we'll just get a plan out. Uh, but if we're looking at Sorry about that schedule. Um, you know, next week is the 20th and then the 27th. So we have a couple weeks in July, but I think if we can get out that, you know, here are the direction of certain things that then that'll help families out in planning. So. I have a few, a couple other things that I'm concerned about overall. Mm -hmm. With details, I just want to put in your mind the way you're making these plans. So. Um, I like the idea of recording all the classes for online new users to use later. I think we need to be careful about privacy concerns and getting confirmation. Because if a student asks a question, then that student's being recorded and getting finding out from the lawyer how that's going to work also. It is. Okay, perfect. Um, hand sanitizer, as, as much as I love to think that all our kids are perfect, and, and it's alcohol 
And I know there were tons of stories about little kids licking their hands later and getting drunk. And I, I don't know how we could even possibly address this in this thing, but we got to think about it at some some point or another. You know, go walking in and out every single class putting hand hand sanitizer on, and I, I don't Maybe know. The I know, I know, and I feel the same way. I never even thought about it. Right, but that's the, that's the thing. You don't think about it, but do it. It happens. So I, it, it's crazy, and it's something. But it's something we do have to think about now. Um, and then also um, at-risk teachers, making sure we're we're considering those people also, and what we can maybe do around that. Oh, one more thing: federal funding. Um, if we do have to go to how, 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 I, I realize that's not the majority of our budget, but um, we need to make sure we're keeping aware. I know there's been talk that if you do remote or you don't have in-person classes and or what percentage that is, that they might cut our federal funding and every little bit counts. So keeping that in mind with our plans also. Hey, this is my, um, I mean, Greg can give you the numbers, but our number from the feds are pretty low, but I tell you right now, I don't think that they should be in control of the situation right now. I they agree. They haven't shown, shown any, any kind of leadership, and I don't want them sticking their nose in it now. Even if it means we lose a quarter of a billion dollars in funding, I would rather do the right thing. But, but we need to be able to make a, that educated decision about that money, too, at that time. So, so the, the, we talked to Lori about the privacy. She said there isn't a privacy issue. There's no issue? Okay. Uh, and uh, if you use, if it call the student, you know, Johnny, you're here or whatever. Uh, the hand sanitizers. I know. You know but may, maybe we'll we put a sign up. <laughs> don't 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 but you know, yeah. It's, it's hard just to do uh, ask, though, so I mean, we do have that on right. the side. Um, so federal funding to the CARES Act, we we got about forty-two or forty-three thousand um, dollars. So the things that we're looking at are. Um, better cameras for the classroom in anticipation of remote. Okay. Um, and they're, so they're better than the, the Chromebook cameras. The other thing we're looking at is uh, uh, basically the top of a water cooler that you can take off what we have existing and it has those touchless water bottle fillers. Uh, the good side the other thing we'll need to do is really encourage the kids to bring their own water bottles as opposed to drinking out of the fountain. Uh, and so those are things that we can get for I forget what it is, three or four hundred dollars, and and uh, so we've we've been looking at how do we spend that that's really going to help us down the road. Um, so 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 that's uh, those are a couple of things, and then science for the end. <laughs> I mean, I know it's crazy. And then I, it's I something agree we have to the, think about so that we know how to address it when it does yeah. come or does hopefully doesn't come about. Yeah. Greg, uh, just one point. Uh, Take a look at uh, with Mary, or we have to decide if if we if a teacher has to has to quarantine or comes down uh, that this COVID not count against their sick leave. Uh, I, I I think it's unrealistic for the for them to be held accountable or utilize their sick leave uh, for this. I know I work for a company that. They, they, you know, they've given us leave of, of utilizing our sick leave. Yeah. Uh, so there's the, and I don't remember, ten or fourteen. You remember? It's um, it's eighty hours. Okay. Is the way it's worded, I think. Is that what you're asking? Like, what's yeah, eighty days? days. Yeah. I think it's an hours. So it well, so it'd be a little, maybe fourteen days. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it's about two so, weeks. so they do get extra time. Um, Check with me at lunch tomorrow. Yeah, it's all going to change. Uh, do we have any board correspondence this evening? Um, did we get that? Okay. Yeah, we. Uh, I'll I'll send it to you. We didn't have it. wasn't in time to put in the packet. I'll put it next month. It was it was uh, a letter from somebody. Okay. 
Do we have any agenda items? Uh, none. Do we have a reason for the closed session? Uh, we do for uh, both personnel and possible uh, litigation discussion. Okay. Do we have a motion to move into closed session? So moved. Motion. Second by Gary. Mr. Parrish? Aye. Mrs. Staub? Aye. Mr. Reynolds? All right. Mr. Henning? Aye. Mr. Haas? Aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Okay, Mr. Carries, we're not in closed session. Thank you, everyone, for attending this evening. I'm going to hang this up, guys. Thank you. No, no. You girls are, I tell you what, I'm not going to be sorry for the teachers. You guys are going to be sorry for the teachers. I'm going to be you know, if after the first week it's like, because I'm watching this, I'm going to have to do it up here, then I'm going to have to adjust. So the answer is I'm going to Thank you. 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 So I don't know, I thought through a couple scenarios. Um, it's really going to depend on how effective that is. Right. So, what do we do with those guys? Or what do we do with people with bugs? Right, like if we're going to have to teach the same lesson twice yeah. each time. Okay. Ideally not, because uh, you've never eaten. Yeah, it's just, it's. Yeah. Well, right, and we're already teaching it. And I teach four yeah. out of twos. So I guess you're teaching the same so thing each time. You know what I mean? <laughs> but we got, I mean, I'm going to do whatever's best for them. So if they can't get it from so watching like, me remotely, then I'm just going to have to. The state you know, they're going to have to kind of like the, the, do new material on the day they're here. And then, this is yeah. so like I just have to feel it out with the kids. If it's still going on, but the state doesn't mandate that we have yeah. to go to school. Right. For some reason, we're going to have to stop going because you have like planes or something like that. Um, I have, I have also had, besides the live stream, I also already have videos of every single class. Yeah. So I would probably, if we had I mean, kids don't have to take, take attendance and check in, you know, for their class. Right? But, you know, again, I don't know what kind of flexibility they're going to give us. It sounds like we're going to let us do what we need to do, but, you know, if I had a kid that was like, I can't see you when we're doing the live stream. Yeah. And then, I, don't and I don't know how much you watch here, I just say, I just say, I like, great. said that they are going you know, to follow the guidelines of the IDPA. And then, you know, I have to evaluate, yeah. is the kid really doing it? You know, because you can tell. So, um. They're, they're doing, they're following so the same people are going to tell us what we're doing. 